Good morning. Margaret, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We have, um, we are just starting the meeting um, and we're all learning about how to start a meeting. <laughs> now that we're, we're sitting in a room together with masks on, talking into the mic rather than into our computer. Um, wow, it couldn't get more complicated than this, right? Right. So, so can, um, this is, I'm Kathy Shane. I'm the chair of the elementary school building committee. And we are here on Wednesday, June 16th at eight in the morning or a little bit after eight, 802. And Margaret Wood from Answer, who is the lead on our owner's project manager part of this, our OPM, and I'll just call her Margaret Wood. So we will all know that that's who. Correct, but I think it might be good just for people to introduce themselves because we have this is our first time we've met together. So I'm Paul Bachelman, town manager, and if you speak into the microphone, that's the only way Margaret will hear us. And you have to push down the button and hold it while you speak and then let go and it'll turn off automatically. Okay. So then just everyone should just go around the room and introduce themselves. Sure. Mike Morris, superintendent. I'm Phoebe Merriam, a parent and Emmer Sipson. <laughs> I'm Jonathan Salvin, also a parent and citizen. Kathy Shane. Steve Schreiber. Anthony Delaney, procurement officer. Ben Harrington, school committee. Rupert Roy Clark, facilities director. Sean Mangano, finance director. And we are all here with the exception of Allison and Diane. Um, yes, it, I, and Ben, Ben has not. Ben is here. So, so no, we're missing Dwayne. 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 And it, is the door downstairs now open or? Yes, everything was open. Okay. Everything so, was open so the last couple minutes ago. So I know Dwayne is joining us, but I think we will start the meeting. Um, and I'm going to introduce Margaret to at least explain to us why we're on a faster schedule than we originally thought. But everyone got a draft of the request for services for design. And Margaret, after our last meeting, got information on on moving this faster and she did an initial draft, which worked off the draft we'd done for the owner of project manager with goals and re reformatted them. Then a few of us looked at it and just added some other pieces and I'll talk about what we've done. So what we're trying to do today is have everyone review that draft document with a focus on the objectives, the goals, for the designer, because as you'll see in the document, a lot of the other is the uh, required text that the granting authority requires. So the place that we particularly added is the objectives and then there's a timeline. And Margaret will also talk us through a slightly different variation. But Margaret, why don't I ask you to lead off to talk about the, the timing that you found out about? Yeah. So. Good morning, everyone. I honestly am really wishing I was there with you because I think this mixture is a little suboptimal, but we'll make it work. Um, so we met last week this time, a little earlier. Um, I got on the phone right after the meeting and talked to the, we have a assigned project manager at the MSBA. Her name is Brittany Gomez. And I because I wanted to walk through with Brittany what they had been unwilling to share with me before, because I'd asked this question a few weeks ago about the timing of the designer selection, knowing that as we discussed last week, we're a little bit crunched for, it'd be nicer to have a longer design period in a nutshell. Um, the news she gave me was not exactly what I had hoped to hear, but in a nutshell, she said, that the designer selection panel, which meets approximately bi-weekly is super booked up right now. 
um, that the earliest meeting that we could be at, which is to say the meeting at which they would review designer applications is September 15th. And then the interviews would be at the next meeting, which I think was October 5th. Um, in order to get in line for that date, we needed to get the RFS in as fast as possible. And she wasn't promising. So we were sort of competing for that spot, that September 15th spot with the other OPM, uh, the other project that had its OPM approved the same day that we were. And that's a project in Winchester. Now I have no idea where the Winchester thing stands. Um, for all I know, they've submitted it, but maybe they haven't. So I let um, Kathy know this and I immediately that afternoon drafted an RFS with some questions. And um, Kathy has kind of masterminded getting several of my questions answered. So what we're gonna do here today is we're gonna walk through what I think is a very good draft. And I also wanna comment that what will happen next is it will go to the MSBA and they'll come back with some comments. So if you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, tomorrow and you're like, oh my gosh, we should have added blah, 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 we can do that. Okay, so I don't want anyone to feel like this is your last crack at it, but it should be as complete as we can possibly make it. Um, so I will we'll have this meeting this morning. I'll send it off to her and say, here it is. Book us for September 15th. Um, and I don't remember the date that it will appear in for public advertisement is in this document. It's the middle of July, essentially. So what happens now is there's this back and forth it gets queued up for advertising. Um, and the actually the MSBA does the advertisement um, in the central register. And then I think we need, we'll need to um, post in the local paper. So that's the background. Um, it, as Kathy said, we've tried to make it relatively clear what is MSBA boilerplate and what is the edits. Kathy, do you wanna pull it up or do you want me to pull it up? Why don't you pull it up, Margaret, and then as we go through it, if if this is okay with everyone, if there are changes people want to make, if you want to add something, then Margaret can make the edit right on there, um, and so she has control of it for the time being. Is that all right with everyone? Okay, Margaret. So, okay, hang on a second. I'm struggling with. I, of course, I'm working from home today with out my multiple screen options. So it's got too much stuff going on. Okay, boom. Okay, can everybody see that? Not yet. Coming up soon? Oh, sorry, yes, we have it. You got it, okay. So um, what we did was we, in this document, what is what we have added as a team is highlighted in yellow. So I'm going to scroll through great chunks of this and just tell you what it is, but it's everything that's not in yellow is MSBA boilerplate. So the first couple of pages are just the instructions. We're not going to look at those. So here we go, you know, put it plugging in the stuff about um, this community. Um, the first um, item I want to just touch on briefly, um, and we can come back to this, but um, the, what the MSBA is looking for here is the construction budget number. Can, should I make this bigger on the screen? Can you all read it? Yeah. Is that better? Um, I think that, is, is everyone okay with that one, that version? Okay. Okay, so they're looking for a construction budget. Now in the, um, in the OPM advertisement, these were the numbers that were used, 40 to 80 million. And that's for the, you know, the small number is the 325 student version. And the big number is the 575 student version. And Sean did, because Kathy and Sean have shared with me his calculation of how he came up with this number, a very, solid way of uh, arriving at these numbers. 
What they're looking for here is construction cost as opposed to project cost. So I did a calculation. I looked at Sean's calculation. What I'm going to recommend here is that we take these numbers and just make it 80% of these numbers. And the reason I say that is that the MSBA has a cap on what they will reimburse for soft costs or project costs of 20%. So I think for consistency's sake, I'm just gonna take these numbers, I'm gonna take off 20% and that's what we'll submit. And then we'll be able to tie it back to the prior advertisement. I actually think it's possible um, that the bigger project could be a little bit less than this, but I, I think it's probably better to under promise and over deliver um, on this. So this is a kind of taking 80% of these numbers is a really sort of easy, straightforward way to link it to the OPM advertisement. Does that make sense? Well, I'm just gonna ask if that's clear because I know I didn't originally understand this range. Any questions? So, so Margaret, when we're talking to the larger public um, about this in the minutes, uh, we should emphasize this is not the total project cost, it's just construction. Yes, I, I think it's important that we, you stick with these numbers for the project cost, okay. but that cost includes OPM fees, designer fees, all the other, you know, quote unquote, soft costs, which are, are uh, services as opposed to construction costs. And again, um, it's not unusual for projects to have a soft cost of more than 20%. I mean, sometimes it can go as high as 25, but the MSBA will only reimburse on 20%. So it's a kind of really clear way of linking these original numbers to the MSBA numbers. If we have time at the end of this meeting, or if not at a future meeting, I will walk you through the MS, how the MSBA generates likely project costs, but I don't think we should spend the time right here. That's fine. Okay. Okie dokie. So continuing on to the next yellow bit. Um, so then here um, we need to plug in uh, M and WB participation goals. Um, this should probably actually be yellow because this is uh, coming from Kathy. And these are consistent with the state's current goals. Um, so then the next piece. Should I just, let me just quickly explain that Margaret because sure. not everyone yeah. knows. We have a bylaw that we passed um, called a responsible employer bylaw that has these target percentages in it. And fortunately, um, it's how we constructed it. It is the same as what the state has in updated and it's also what MSBA has seen. So I just put them in. That's where, that's the origin of these numbers. Yeah, and again, again it, you really wanna be consistent here with how you're managing things in the town. They've, they've, they've given um, flexibility now for these to be greater if you want them to be, but I think, the consistency is really important across all town projects. All right, so this background piece, this all, I mean, I just took what was in the OPM advertisement and I, I made some minor edits and I plugged it all in. So I'm not really going to um, focus on this because you will have seen it and signed off on it before. It just, it talks about the buildings, the student population, the kinds of things that are the background information. Um, it talks about the former failed vote. It plugs in the enrollment agreement. Um, and I'm going to recommend this piece about Crocker was in the OPM advertisement, but I don't think it's directly pertinent to this project. So I was gonna recommend that we take it out unless anyone feels strongly about that. It, does everyone, is that all right with it? Does anyone, I'm looking around the room. It looks like it's fine. That can be deleted. It's gone. <laughs> all right, so then um, this just tells a little bit about the committee um, and then uh, points to this web page 
where there's a lot more information. All right, so now this is the most important section for us to talk about, this project goals and general scope. Um, because um, this is really, when the designers are reading these applications, this is where they're gonna look to understand what it is you want to see from them in the applications, okay? So um, this first piece was from the designer uh, or the OPM advertisement. So, um, and Kathy added this, which was the OPM approval. Oops. Okay, so here's where we're gonna start in. So what I did to draft this, I have to say, I thought that the committee did a pretty stellar job of laying out objectives in the OPM advertisement. Many of the items that were mentioned um, are, are, I really think of as being mostly in the designer's court. So I just pulled those in and I kind of organized them in buckets. So there's a couple of budget buckets. So again, this is where the designer's reading this and going, oh yes, I know what project I would use to illustrate. I know what to say about this. So you have to kind of think about what it is they're looking. So the buckets are excellence in design for educational programming, excellence in design for community engagement, use and access, excellence in design for safe and cost-effective building operations, excellence in sustainable design, excellence in design for cost control, excellence in workforce diversity and wage compliance, and then lastly, um, support, uh, community engagement support during feasibility and design. So um, I think organizing it that way kind of helps you sort of group things together. So um, going back to the top, excellence in design for educational programming, um, these, 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 with minor edits, um, these items, the uh, six items, pretty much came directly out of what was in the OPM advertisement. Uh, modern classroom environment, integrated spaces for special programs and populations, flexible spaces for assemblies, good air quality, temperature control, and lighting, natural light throughout the building, and then use of outdoor space for creative play. Actually, I take it back. The, one, the first item, a warm child-centered environment designed to make the building feel small um, and this use of outdoor space for creative play, those were added to the other ones. So I'm gonna pause there for a moment because this bucket is really important. Is there anybody who um, has any questions or further thoughts about those for, again, for educational programming? Hey. I have to keep my mask on. Yeah, so thank you so much for this. So I guess I have a broad comment, which is the major headings. And because uh, we use say excellence in design a number of times. So mm -hmm. I think excellence in design is assumed. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we can't just say educational programming, then community engagement, use and access, then safe and cost-effective building operations, sustainable design, and just leave out the excellence in design. It just seems that, um, they shouldn't be applying if they're not, if they don't see themselves as being excellent in design. But then the the other point I wanted to make was the, first of all, I think it's a great list, or second of all, whatever, but the um, design to make the building feel small. So that that um, is an arguable goal, like maybe designed to make the building feel human scaled or but small, I'm not sure what that means. And I'm not sure how we would measure that. And nor do I, am I completely confident that's a goal we're looking for. But I, I like the first part, a warm child-centered environment. Steve, how would you feel about um, the use of the word intimate? Mm. Some people yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, feel, uh, um, uh, uh, feel like an elementary school. Um, I don't know. Uh, any other yeah. is, any other comments? This just so people know, I 
put that in because we, Mike had kind of, when he said small, warm, he, he had intimated that, yes. I don't have the perfect word for this, but I, I understand what the goal here is. I, I kind of support that goal that, that, you know, there is a concern that, or it has been a concern expressed in the community that, that, a, that the school not feel big, you know, that there's still a community feel to, to the, the structure when it's complete. But as I say, I don't have the right word. Yeah, because, you know, I think, um, I mean, intimate may not be the right word either, but I think, you know, you can have um, a large building that creates small uh, or cozy environments for elementary school children. So I, I think there's the instinct is correct. I, I mean, it's also possible that a warm child centered environment is enough here. So I have two questions. First, on the excellence in, I thought that was an interesting thing you put in there, Margaret. And I wondered what your logic was, because I agree with Steve, it seemed redundant every time. And so I saw you delete it, but I was wondering if you had some reason for putting in excellence in design. Was that to sort of emphasize that we care a lot about this? Because I think the redundancy of that just made it feel like, oh, they're looking for really high quality. So that's point one. Point two. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and but I, I felt like I didn't understand why that was there. Same question Steve had. And on the and that the design to make the feel, the building feel small just jumped out at me too. Is like being that sounds terrible because um, I think we all understand what the intent was, but I don't think that those words achieved it. And I don't think small is the right word. I don't think intimate is the right word. And I would agree that a warm child centered environment achieves the goal. Any other comments, um, Yama? Sorry, it's been a while since I've been yeah. in this room. Um, uh, I had two. I'm fine with leaving it as is. If we want to stay with the wordsmithing on that, I wondered a wild child-centered environment explicitly designed for young children, something like that, because it's it's not then it's not you know small big like those are kind of yeah I won't get into the weeds on that, but. If we need anything, that's just another one that I think recognizing this is an elementary school, we don't want it to feel or be like a middle school or high school. And maybe that gives a designer a sense of we're really thinking about young kids here, you know, because that, that's the goal, right? The goal is this document is sent out and designers say, oh, we know what they want and we've done that. And here's some examples. And so, so if I don't know, people, I'm fine, redu you know, cutting that whole thing, but just that was my thought. And the other one was, five or six, I guess, six bolts down, good air quality, temperature control. I wonder, even though this is, I'm sure everyone's gonna talk about this, if we add something about good air quality and ventilation, just because I think it's good to point it out explicitly, you know, as a community where people are rightfully, you know, reading scientific journals about ventilation in schools and, and all that kind of stuff, which is a good thing, but I think calling it out explicitly, um, cause it's not the same thing as air quality as Rupert and Ben have explained to me multiple times. Um, if the committee was was open to that, I, I thought it might be a, a helpful addition. I, I, if, is everyone fine with the changes we've just made? Just yes. Okay. Um, I added that very last bullet: use of outdoor space for creative play and to encourage outdoor learning and climate awareness. For a couple reasons, one, I was really struck when Shelley Hotoff talked about the Zero Net Energy building as a learning lab. And the other is that we lost some children to during COVID because there were other private schools that could convert to using the outdoor space as a learning place. So I thought it was something anticipating a, a potentially different world. So I didn't know whether everyone would be fine with that, but it seemed to go with thinking about the future. That wasn't in our original list. I think it's a good ad, honestly. I, I would definitely agree with adding that. All right, going once, going twice. Yes, Steve. Yeah, I love the last bullet. And I think that it should be two bullets. One outdoor space for play, which is kind of one purpose of an elementary school. But then the outdoor learning. So outdoor learning means what you're talking about, the uh, you know, pandemic or or being outside as much as possible. But then there's also the environmental awareness, which you also have there, but in a way the, I don't know if that's worth two bullets, just to, I'd hate to see it all get lost. It, 
I'd rather have the city. I'm, I would be fine making it too if others are fine. I mean, uh, how's that? Okay, with those changes. Great. And maybe I'll just leave my mic on so I don't forget to turn it on. All right. Nice job, team. All right, let's move on to community engagement. So this is a little simpler. We had the last one. There's two bullets, space for community purposes after school hours with controlled access. This is a little bit of wordsmithing from something that was in the OPM advertisement, but what I understood, and this I don't feel like this is yet ideally phrased, is you want to be able to use the building, but not necessarily use the whole building. So you want to be able to use some part of it, maybe with you know maybe the performance space with bathrooms while having the rest of the building separate. Um, in this situation, that's an important design thing to state because um, not that anyone's coming to the table with the design, but um, how you arrange the kit of parts on the site. Um, if you need to do that is, is an important distinction to make. And then the second one was broad engagement with the public in all phases of the project, um, beginning with feasibility. Now that's a duplicated a little bit down here, um, but I think that's okay because it's, really, it's a really important um, item. I'm just looking around the room to see people, Steve, so, you know, again, I love the bullets here, but so I'm, I'm just trying to think of how this is organized. So these are two very different things. So the first bullet is about the actual design of the building. So like mm -hmm. what's the product that the town is getting. The second one is more about the process. So I'd rather, I personally would rather have those separate. So we have a, we have a major heading for the process. Um, I would rather, so thinking about how somebody organizes this, they might have portfolio pieces that describe the, you know, the first couple of few bullets here. And then they might have, you know, other kinds of examples about how they engage with process. I think for the simplicity, I think we should separate those. So what Margaret just did is she moved it, she made it a, a one bullet, your two dressers, yeah, yeah. and then move the, yeah community engagement as a process down to the last section. Yeah, yeah. yeah Anthony. So would it not belong with the very last yeah. section on community engagement during feasibility design? Yeah. yeah. So I just moved it down and I changed the heading here to take out engagement. And then I just, it just says community use and access. And then there's just this one bullet about being able to use part of the school, not all of the school. Sound good? Okay, so then this next section, um, this is again me wordsmithing a little bit what was in the OPM advertisement, safe and cost-effective building operations, security, um, access control, um, COVID-19 um, best practices and minimized operating and maintenance costs, including design for net zero operations. Um, for Paul. So it's it's not just student security, it's everybody's security, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and improved building layout and access. What do we improve? If this is a new design, I don't understand what the way the word improved is there. Well, I think um, we could take out improved um, I, and we probably should, you know, the, remember that um, the MSBA is going to ask you to look at um, renovations as well as new construction. So in that sense, improved has a meaning, but let, let's take it out because I do think it's a little, con a little confusing here. Yes. Oh, good. I got my mic. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, operating costs, I think we want to have some language in there to talk about lifetime costs as well. 
I think that's really important. I didn't catch what kind of did you say life cycle? Life cycle costs, yeah. Life cycle costs. Okay. Does that look at that, does that work? It goes. Yeah, I think even just having the word in there with nothing else is fine. This is great. And you know, just as a um, quick addition to this, I, I listened, I only was able to listen to half of a webinar that MSBA ran on zero net energy, but one of the things they emphasized on maintenance and operating was in the design phase, having the maintenance people be part of interactive for, I wouldn't do it this way versus that way in terms of the building design, that several of them in the project said that that had been really important for working well once the building was open. So. So I think it's just something to think about when we look at whoever is proposed to us as designers. So there's a little bit of question on my part about um, this phrase here, which then gets repeated again in the next part. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll leave it up to you whether we should repeat it. So the next section is sustainable design. So um, compliance with Amherst Net Zero Energy Bylaw. Is, Kathy, is there a link that I could include here to the bylaw? I, I tried to find one online. Yes, yes. yeah, we, yeah we, we can find a link for yeah. you. Um, I think it would probably help them if we just put it yeah. in here. So Anthony, then they Anthony. Can... Do you not have a link to all the bylaws? Just a couple lines down for a responsible employer? Uh, no, I linked on that one. I think I linked it just to um, 355. If you click no, it, you know, that's, whole... a, that's a link to the entire set of bylaws. Okay, so that link takes you to the whole set, Margaret. I did a hot link. Um, oh, okay. Then let's then let's leave that. But we we I can I can send it to you and you can figure out whether you want to hot link it this way or just include the two later. Um, I, ideally, I would put it right here with, with this bullet. Um, because because it, I will tell you, I mean, some people who are applying will like go and read the whole bylaw and really want to do that. So I think it's helpful to provide it to them if someone can send it to me. Um, well, I'll do, we'll make sure we do it. Okay. Then he's do it right now. Great. You know, the, I had a question for the net zero experts. Um, when we say net zero, does everyone understand that we do not want to uh, heat or cool with, it's always renewable, you know, that we're using, it's all electric. So is that understood in net zero? Is that a question for me or for your team? Yeah, it's a question for the team, you know, so is that an understood clear, Every school or the elder buildings, they all end up being all electric and then they're uh, generating the offset with solar or wind or, or something else. So, is it, yeah, Steve, so it's already understood in terms. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. The answer is it's understood that okay. anyone. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, so, this I, one. Is there another question? Rupert. Oh, I was just going to comment that I think uh, taking the net zero operations out of safe and cost effective would be a good idea because it, I think that just diminishes the force of the first part of the sentence. I agree. So let's do that. Okay. I think this is very straightforward and, and this is clearer by deleting it. Everyone's fine with that change. Okay. So I want to just comment about this item, which is that this is one the MSBA is going to want to see in there, and, and I just pulled it in from the OPM. Um, you do get um, some, uh, I'm trying to remember if it's I think one or two additional points of reimbursement for um, compliance, higher levels of compliance 
with lead. Um, and so um, the first one, the first bullet is really about the town's requirements. The second bullet is really about the way the MSBA calculates reimbursement. Okay. And, and designers are given the option to use um, uh, CHIPS, the Northeast Collaborative for High Performance Schools or LEAD. So. Uh, um, cost. Yes, we have a, wait, wait a minute, Margaret, we have one question up here. Okay. Margaret, uh, just based on the way you, you phrase that lessons, do, will we ultimately have input on which one they choose? I don't, I don't know enough about the non lead option there to, to know whether or not, uh, you know, we as a committee would, would have a preference for one over the other, but is it, is it purely a designer, uh, preference or it's it a it's a designer preference? recommendation to you and and they'll provide the reasons that they're recommending it um my last last time i looked at this what i remember was that lead was hard much harder to satisfy in a renovated building um and i think in a new building they're more equal um but i it's i i'm not i don't know the nitty gritty details of that. So it, the recommendation would come from the design team. Yep, Sean. Thank you. Um, three things. Um, one, I have to leave at 845. So if you see can me you, sneak away, that's uh, why. Is your mic on? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the second thing was under sustainable design, what does the second part of the first bullet point mean? Um, I think that might make it seem like the building could be net zero energy ready, but I think if we're complying with the bylaw, then it has to be net zero. So I don't know if um, we need that second part of, unless there was a specific reason for it. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I, I think the point is kind of the point we made in our interview a little bit that um, the designers are not responsible for making sure that you have the electrical supply, the, the town has to figure that out. So, um, you know, if, if for some reason um, you didn't have the electrical power at the time the building came online, the building still needs to operate. Um, so that may be splitting hairs, but okay. um, I can take that out if you think it's more clear. It's, it's a very fine point. Okay. Um, and then the second piece was under um, cost control. Yes. It'd be nice to see something about, um, you know, limiting change orders or design, you know, design to minimize change orders. I know that's something that always comes up with big projects like this. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know how we say that, but something that just gives, you know, that we'd like to see the, the design as complete as possible. So, just, so that we don't see a lot of change orders throughout the process. I think, honestly, Sean, I, I, I always worry about statements like this because um, you tend to, you, you can get back a fair amount of blather about it, but I, I do agree it's an important objective to state. And you know, to me, what that means is that you're gonna have really well-coordinated documents, does it, bid documents. So let's, let's add that, that's great, okay. And I, it just was everyone fine. I th thought I saw nodded. We took off the second clause. We just have it compliance with the net zero energy bylaw. So that's our goal, right? Okay. And since we all worked through that, okay. Okay. Anything else on cost control? Okay. Workforce diversity and wage compliance. And then this one, I think, is worth a little discussion. So I just pulled in, you know, this is the bullet that I pulled in from up above. But I think, um, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move it up to be the first bullet. Agree. So then we have three bullets.
Does that look good to everybody? Broad engagement, participation, and strong communication skills. That looks, that structure looks good to me. Okay. All right, I'm gonna save this in case something happens and we'll keep going. So that's honestly, Sean, if you have to go, I think that's, that's the part we really needed you here for. So I'm gonna keep going, but. Um, Steve, you, Steve has a. So, so um, help me out here. We're not saying anything about the public art. Um, oh. So we, we have a public art by law also. Thank you, Steve. I thought of that. We, we have a percent for art uh, okay. by law. Um, so where do we, where would, you, where would we, where would we call it out? Excellence in design for art. Yeah. I know. Um, I think it would be in the very first part. No. I think I'd make it a separate category. I, I think it's an important point. It's going to get lost. So um, the only other place you might put it is under community use, where we only have one bullet. Yeah, that's true. That's a good. So point. if you if community use, uh, public art and access, we put the you know in the title. Yes. I just want to say I really agree with that. I mean. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I have a lot of thoughts about involving the community, particularly students, if it's a school and we're doing a massive art project um, and that. So I really like that element of it. Um, and I think it's the right place. I think it, it situates it where, you know, and I'm just one person in the committee, but from my vantage point, uh, I would much want, much more want students involved in such a project. Uh, I know there'll be the hiring and, you know, there's a certain amount of money has to be spent more than someone externally just coming in and doing it. It, it really should be a community-wide event. It's a school, it should involve students. So I really like that and um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, and we, we will, we, it's a percent for, it's percent for art, uh, per, percent for public art. Well, I don't remember, but we have a specific bylaw and we can yeah. again, send you the link to that. If I may. Yep. It, um, Margaret, I just sent you a link to the whole bylaw and it's in there. All you have to do is Google percent for art. And it's actually percent spelled out. It's actually 0.5%. Percent, but... <laughs> percent so, spelled out. Just, just oh, sorry. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, and take one out yeah. and take the one out. We, we went to less than one. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Super. All right, good catch. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. You know, I actually thought of that as we were. All right, so going once, going twice on this. Remember, if you wake up in the middle of the night with something we forgot, we can we can deal with that. Okay. So so the next section is really what the designers have, who they you know it's more contractual stuff. Kathy, um, I should, before I send this off, confirm with the town's legal counsel that they're not looking for insurance requirements in excess of what's in the MSBA contract, the standard contract. So Paul, and it, Paul is pointing to himself, so, oh, okay. or, or Anthony, and, he, and Anthony. We, we can follow up on that. Okay. I mean, those, um, re those requirements are not in excess uh, those requirements are greater than the standard requirements that we require as, as part of our normal stamp town contract. So I don't anticipate we would need to go higher than that. It, I will say, I think it is important because if you start um, having higher limits, you can limit the designer pool. Um, so it would be great if we could, if you guys get back to me today, I'll just take that out. Okay. Um, okay. So. I think you can take that out. Okay, I right think now. they're saying that you can take it out, Mar Margaret, that we... Um... I... Okay. So um, the, this next section is just a list of documents we're gonna give them. And thanks to Mike, um, I've got a pretty good list of um, the things that... Um, I'm going to include, which is, um, I know I have a site survey for 
the Wildwood site. And I, I don't think there's a site survey that's been done yet for Port River, is that right? It's in, well, Jonathan can speak to it. I think it's in the larger, that it wasn't a separate document. It's in the larger Fort River study. Is that? I, that's my belief, but uh, you know, it's been a year plus now, so memory can be fuzzy. Okay, so, so I, I will say, I'm not gonna attach these here. I'm just gonna make a list when I send it to the MSB of what we are planning to attach. Um, and Mike? Yeah, I feel really confident supporting Jonathan's point. It was in that larger Fort River document because the site issues were the issues. Yeah. So, you know, whether they're met to, with, you know, however people feel about the survey and the findings, they were there because I remember that being large part of discussion. And, and Margaret, on educational program, what you've got from the Wildwood project was um, a building, the structure was going to split the grades, but a lot of the things that weren't about the grade specific would still apply that those were worked through. So I don't know how you said you're going to just reference them and people give people links to them, but you know how we we haven't yet gone through the K through five to something part of, of the grade structure. So however right. you yeah. Okay. Okay. So um and then Mike, I can't remember if I saw, but in the is there a place that the information and listening session material is is published or are you in our and if not are you comfortable with me including it as an attachment yeah so in that long 700 they were listed in um in that document we also included a link to the statement of interest listening sessions because that you know that's directly relevant to this case so it's in the many links i sent you i apologize for that's i'll you. find it lots I'll of blue it. font but yeah. uh with lots of pages behind it but it's in there okay and again i'm not gonna when i send this to the msba i'm not gonna attach all this stuff i'm just gonna tell them it is our intention to attach it just because i want to get it off to them today um, okay, so here's a chunk of stuff to talk about, which is schedule. Um, so this schedule, milestone schedule, starts with the assumption that we get in the pipeline for the September 15th application review, and then in the pipeline for the October 5th contract execution, sorry, um, interviews. And then I've picked a date, you know, a couple of days later, the, the interviews would be on a Tuesday. And then I'm basically saying that by that Friday, we would have a contract executed. Um, that's pretty fast, but um, I've done it before. So, um, so then, then we do our work and the next milestone is, the preferred schematic report, which is the end of this phase and the approval at the MSBA board meeting in July of the following year becomes um, the last milestone before the local funding authorization. So, you know, here's the, they approve it, they approve the scope and budget agreement at the next meeting, um, this is the date, I believe, I'll, the MSBA will confirm this, that your agreement expires, which is 120 days after um, this meeting. Okay, so they, they, they approve the scope and budget, and then you have 120 days to get to the vote. And here's your vote. So local project funding authorization on, um, November 8th, 2022. So um, I took a look at then what I thought was the likely um, timeline for uh, project completion. And I made pretty conservative assumptions. I wanna share that with you all because I actually had the project ending in 2026 um, and then and so let me, I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna open my little schedule. 
because I think I kind of gathered that um, that date seemed surprising to everybody. So I want to talk through how I got to it. Um, and just Margaret, this first set of dates that are yellow in the document were in the draft you sent us, except that I changed it to 25. So correct. What we're about to see, no one has seen, I guess, except a couple of us since then. <laughs> and you know, again, I'm I'm a big one for under promising and over delivering. So that's kind of in the mix here too when I'm looking at this. Some reason I'm not getting this thing to show up. Let me put away a couple things here. Aha. I'm going to have to enlarge this for everybody to see it, but um, can you all see this? Yes. Yeah, okay. It to be a little bigger. Aha. All right. How's that on everybody's screen? Is that legible? Um, on the big on the big screen. Whoops. Sorry, I just clicked the wrong button. Okay. Does that work for everyone? Yep. yep. Okay. So let me make it bigger on my screen. Okay. So Here's what I did to generate the milestone dates that occur in here. So here we are, local appropriation, November 8th, right? So we sign, we, then we get the designer, you know, they get to start basically, as soon as you're comfortable, they can start design development. Um, I have shown five months for design development. At the end of that, there is an MSBA submission. Then I have given them eight months for what are you know known as 60% construction documents. And again, there's a submission. Then I have given them five months for the completion of construction documents for the purpose of bidding. Then I have given us three months to bid it. So you can see now we're in kind of the summer, right? Here's June, July, and August. We're in the summer of 2024, um, which I think if it's a new construction project, it would actually be better if it was, we could get it even more closely lined up with the end of school. So if we could be, if we could back this all up a month, that would be ideal because then, you're gonna start construction and typically the beginning um, construction activities can be pretty disruptive. So they might include demolition, they might include site work. If, you know, it's the stuff that you don't wanna be doing. You wanna really use your summer when the buildings are mostly empty intensively. But um, other than kind of wiggling around this, then I showed, a 24 month construction schedule. Now, could it be less than that? Yes, it probably could, but it's very much in my mind here that we're, um, we need to look at renovation options as well as new construction options. Um, renovation, if you did renovation, would it be a phased renovation? And, it, and even if you do new construction, you're probably doing phased construction on an occupied site. So this is a pretty conservative assumption. And you can see how all of a sudden, ouch, you're in 2026. Um, this is um, the move in date, this is close out. So that's how I got to the 2026 completion of construction in the draft, Kathy and everybody. Does that make sense? It, it, it would clear, clearly be a goal if we could do it faster to do it faster. But again, I don't wanna overpromise on this right now. 
So, so right now, just so you know, Margaret, those dates are not in our current draft. So that it just the the the, the, the year numbers are different. But I, I'm right. going to turn it over to everyone for comments, reactions. Yes. I, from my experience, the the schedule that that Margaret's outlined is is both conservative but really realistic. I, I think that's where we would be. Um, while you could go faster. Uh, I think those are reasonable dates. And Mike. So I agree. I, I want to put out a slight caution about getting to November 8th, 2022. Um, I think Margaret appropriately described that, you know, this is going to be a push for the designer to get all these things done. Timeline. I think if there wasn't a townwide election already on November 8th, I wonder if we'd be pushing that back two months, but there is a townwide election on November 8th. So, you know, I, I get that there's some practical reality. I just wanted to share some degree of caution about the level of engagement that's possible in the timeline that's here. Uh, it doesn't anything that bothered me. I just want to flag it as something that perhaps the committee, once the designers on board, will have to come back to in terms of the, the terrible overuse of that word, but the, the uh, likelihood of that being satisfactory to the larger community. So I'm not saying it's not, I just want to note that that's a lot faster than, um, that's an accelerated timeline a bit. I think we have a lot of advantages. We have tremendous amount of data. I think, you know, school committee, go Ben, is uh, doing a lot of work on the front end of sixth grade question and we'll continue to do that. Um, so I think we have a lot of advantages. I just wanted to note that for the committee that this, this would be a bit accelerated. No, I agree. And I think, um... If this gets finalized with that, we're going to have to explain that that is the big, the first big reach is uh, November 8, 2022. Um, I, I just have a, I have a question on, um, at the point we're going to vote in the town, um, the design that we will be looking at, we will have made a decision whether it's the consolidated school, which site it will be on, and will people have enough in that design to get a sense of what the building will, would look like? So we're not at the 25%, the 60%, the ex on schematics. So is the answer yes? You know, so you could put some pictures up, you know, in, in terms of how you talk to the broader community. Um, about what's what's the school look and feel like? I think I'm seeing Steve and Jonathan both nod their heads. Yes, I they they should be able to provide some visual context for what their design is going to look like. I think we should be a little bit, you know, careful that, that it won't be a final design at that point. Mm -hmm. It is still feasibility and, and and both the look and the feel and the size of a project could change. Um, but yes, they should be provide, providing. The, the character um, expression that we would want people to react to. Mike. I don't want to belabor the point and extend the meeting. I think the other thing I want to note is my prediction, uh, and hopefully people look back on this minute me, meeting minutes and laugh at me later, but I think the site is going to be uh, an area that the community needs high levels of engagement on. Yep. Um, that may be as much or more than the actual design of the school. I think the site's gonna be a big thing for people uh, on this particular matter. I don't, I, I'm not weighing in on what the right site is or anything, but I just wanna note that, that that's gonna be a big one. Ma Margaret, could you hear all of that? I did, yes. Yeah, the decision of whether it's the Wildwood physical site or Port River will be a, a big Huge. one that requires a, a lot of discussion for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Agreed. Steve. Well, you had me super psyched at the 2025 move-in date, and I marked my calendar, but <laughs> I, I have an eraser. But um, never. Uh, we also have to consider not just the school committee and the town council, but all the other boards and commissions that will be involved. Um, for example, mm -hmm. planning board, zoning board, depending on you know what the particular project might be, those, those approvals. Historic commission. So. Wildwood and Fort River are 50 years or at least approaching 50 years old, which is a trigger in Am Amherst for historic commission review. And there might be, who knows what else, what I'm forgetting, but 
those yeah. also add to the schedule. Yeah. Well, and honestly, um, the if there is the MSBA will expect to see as part of feasibility at least conceptual agreement to any of those issues before the board will vote on the project. So that actually is going to have to be addressed um, prior to the MSBA board vote for the project. Kathy? Yes, Paul. Um, is it possible to, I mean, I think Mike's point is, is accurate. And I think location is going to be the one that um, it's going to matter. Can we sort of tag when that decision has to be made so we know when it when that conversation has to happen? Because I think that's so pivotal to everything. Yes. So that, um, and, and I can pull it up if you want me to, but that will happen in the first four to five, five months. So designer joins the team in um, October of 2021, this, this year. The first submission, which is at the end of that, quote unquote, quote unquote there's feasibility, you'll remember, and then there's schematic design. So feasibility is doing all the due diligence and um, updating the program and identifying the options and picking an option. So when you make your feasibility submission, you're making a submission that says, we have, this is the range of options and this is the one we're going to pursue in schematic design. So it will, I would basically say October, November, December, January, February. By the end of February, approximately, you will be needing to state to the MSBA which is your preferred option. So, is there time built in for community discussion about that? So, so it it will ha it will happen. I I think it's going to happen kind of fast and furious during that five month period. So, so I also didn't want to be like a doomsday person. I just think it's going to be really, that, that's going to be a really sticky wicket uh, going down to two schools changes the dynamic. I think in people's thoughts, we have a lot of information on site information. None of that means that it's going to be an easy decision for the community to make. So um, that I, again, I don't want to overplay that point, but I do think um, that's going to be one of the high points of conflict. I agree. And, and actually, for those of you who attended the OPM selection committee meeting, this is exactly, you know, why Mary Paquetti was questioning me about that schedule, because, uh, you know, she sees what you see, which is that there's quite a bit of community engagement that needs to happen in order for the project to move forward on the timeline that we presented. And just, just can you, if we what is the, you, you had key dates for at the MSBA level, the going backwards to that first five months, you know, getting this to them. If we miss that target, what's the next target? I mean, um, you know, you answer it right now. So I'm just, you know, so Mike's worrying about, so are we talking about it's another three months, which moves this all by three months, or, or is it much longer than that? Just on a. Hang on one second. I, I think I can, I think there's a short answer to that question, okay. um, which is that we take a less aggressive approach to the MSBA board vote. Um, let me just see if I can find my schedule. Um, so. Yeah. In a nutshell, not to pull up another document and confuse things, yeah. my schedule had a kind of idealized schedule in terms of getting the MSBA board vote before the local vote. But you could act, it's not uncommon. I think the, the schematic design issue is really that you have to have, you have to have the cost of the project established in time to put it into all the publication requirements for a vote. So you can work back from that date in terms of the submission. I had worked back from the elect from the, the vote date to the to get the MSBA board meeting ahead of your meeting, but you could 
work back from the vote date to when you need the dollar value. And the MSBA board vote can come along more in parallel with the local appropriation. It, they, it is not unheard of for the local appropriation to happen first and the MSBA board meeting to happen second, right? And then you're sort of, you're pushing on the, the detailed design and construction schedule, but that has more float in it than the feasibility does. Does that make sense? Yeah. I had an MSBA board vote in July, right? I mean, you could have the MSBA board vote post local appropriation. You just have to have the dollar value for the appropriation in time to get it into all the publications for the election. So I'm looking around. Uh, yeah, hi, GB. Um, so because I have not been part of this process before, I want to I want to clarify, I understand when the end date of sort of the, the community needing to understand and, and uh, all of that, what is the start date? Is the start date of that not until the designer is on board or is it after that? I'm wondering what that period of time is that we have to bring this to the community and get community involvement and uh, buy-in and all of those sorts of things. So, um... No, the designer will be on board, we hope, um, in October. Um, that's the October 8th that was in that um, milestone schedule. So the designer's on board right away and they are really doing the bulk of the work for feasibility and schematic design. So that's why I was saying earlier, you get the designer on board in October. So now you really want to be making your in order for them to have enough time to do the detailed schematic design, which is going to be the basis of your funding agreement, you want to have the selected option in, let's call it February. And then from February until the, the final pricing submission, um, you just need to leave yourself enough time to get that number, the cost of the project into the election publications. Um, so to clarify, maybe I was not clear. I meant in terms of the location, the site mm -hmm. chosen. So the site, again, the, so the site chosen that first five months, so designer on board, October, November, December, January, February, it's in that five months that you need to look at the site options pick the preferred option if you're gonna do new construction and then um, point in the range of options that you're looking at, say, we wanna do that option. And then you have to submit that to the MSBA and say, that is our preferred option. Yeah, Jonathan. And, Paul. Um, I, and I think what I'm hearing is the engagement of our broader community around the site question needs to happen in that 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 five month period because that's exactly right before we uh, as a group are you know kind of commenting on the designer's uh suggested location yeah paul so yeah so the decision matrix is one school or two right and then location of if it's one school where's the location and those are all all that has to happen between the october to february of of this year right yeah correct <laughs> that's mike's angst <laughs> yeah i'm i'm just going to quickly pull up um one other document that might if sometimes the picture is written no, that words. everyone is saying okay you know that's a Intense set of meetings, Paul. And who is the decision maker on location? Is it this committee? Is it the town council school committee? Who is that decision maker? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to see if I can answer that. So because this particular, hmm, so there's an educational plan, which was referenced earlier, it needs to be written. Part of that educational plan has a grade configuration component. So if there's a great configuration change, as at least one of the two options has, the school committee has to vote and approve that. So that decision lies with Ben and his four colleagues on the school committee. Um, in this 
sort of awkward instance that sort of defines which option gets chosen. Because if it's a K through five school, that's one option, but there's, there's no option that has the same configuration. We have two options and they each have grade configuration, grade configuration is a school committee decision. As it relates to site, that's this body. Um, school committee, I mean, they can weigh in like any member of the public, any other elected body uh, or board or appointed board, but, and, and Margaret can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel pretty confident that this committee ends up making the determination of site. Margaret, I get that right? You did, you got it exactly right. Um, I, I, can everybody see the schedule that I pulled up? Yeah. Um, this is just to kind of recap what I was saying earlier. So, you know, we're here in this blue zone. You know, this is the OPM coming on board. This is, has designer selection going through the end of October, which could still happen, honestly, if we don't get in for the October 5th interview, it'll be the next one, which I wanna say is probably October. 19th, right? So I was hoping that we would get the designer on earlier, but the MSBA's schedule preclude that. So here's feasibility, right? And it's a, it's in this phase that you would kind of, and, and I agree, it's very fast. You would look at the sites, recommend a site, um, and do exactly what Mike was both just describing. On coming from the other end, my point was, if your vote is in November, right, here it is, um, I, had I had developed this to have the submission, which is a schematic design. So here's schematic design, which is six months. I had had that to allow for the submission to the MSBA and an MSBA vote before the election but you could actually have it after. You could make the submission later, but that it's this submission that has the dollar value that is going in the election materials. So the difference between this red thing and this yellow thing can be reduced by the, the date that you need the value for the election materials. And it gives you a little bit of wiggle room on this end. Does that make sense? So ben, ben. Yeah, kind of in the in, in interest of the uh, rapid fire timeline here, what ideally when would we need to determine like grade configuration by, like in order to keep this timeline? Here, by February. And you, maybe you could push it to March and have the schematic design, you know, start a month later and run a month later. But it's, I would say it's February or March. And Mike, can that, could that in theory just move faster that if, if the sixth grade issue is a live issue anyway? Um, yeah, Ben, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but at the last Amherst School Committee meeting, we had a conversation, I think there was, uh, a discussion anyway about making that determination separate from MSBA or at least somewhat separately from MSBA process in the fall because the Amherst School Committee is considering whether that would be the right thing to do for the 2022-2023 school year unrelated to MSBA or at least primarily unrelated. Is that a fair statement? Um, based on space needs in our current school because of construction that happened because of COVID. Um, so I don't think that timeline I don't anticipate one way or the other. I don't anticipate that timeline being a problem because I think the committee wants to take that up. And I think, I think we'll be talking about our next meeting, which I think is Tuesday night. So, um, um, but I think we'll, we'll have, by the time this group gets together, I think there'll be more work done on the Amherst School Committee side on a timeline for that decision-making process. Because I think if that got made earlier in a separate way, then you're talking about a K through five design, which makes it easier then to look at the two sites you know, to say wild exactly, or, you know, it, it just, you know, this is the size of the school, at least in my, you know, so yeah, Steve. Yeah, that was going to be my question. So just to clarify something said earlier. So if it's K through five, that suggests one, we're talking about one building. If it's K through six, maybe not, or. 
So the only design piece, only design enrollment that we're permitted to study based on our agreement with MSBA, if it's K to six is 320 students. So the 575 student school is not an option if we're staying K to six. Sorry, I missed one part of what you said at Sorry, the very end. 575 student option is, is not an option not if our elementary schools stay K to six. Yeah, so that's the only reason I was saying that it's the site. Once six isn't in, we're down to the consolidated school. Um, otherwise, we don't have enough space for people <laughs> um, in the 320. <laughs> so, if okay, so any, I'm just looking around. This is interesting versus Zoom. <laughs> 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 left, left and right. Um, uh, any other questions on on what we've gone through? Because I think we've gotten to the point we have a draft that we're turning over to Margaret to put the final pieces on in terms of the the links and other things um, that would submit the draft. Um, yes, Paul. So uh, if if we have tiny little editorial changes, just send that to you and Margaret. There are a couple yeah. of things that we're going to change, yeah. So, so Anthony, yeah. Are we not going to discuss selection criteria? Yes, we are, we are. Okay, so uh, well, just, but, I mean, let me just say the selection criteria are based on your objectives. So the piece that we went through that was objectives, that's what the selection, that, that basically is the selection criteria. The other criteria is team members, which we haven't talked about yet. So can you, and, and one thing I, in the OPM, we assign points to that. And in the draft you've got, if you put that part back up, it's a list that came out of MSBA's list with just all of the following things plus our objective. So how, do, how does that get weighed was so my- So the, the MSBA will not want you to do that, what you did for the OPM. Um, they will um, basically be asking you to come to the um, review of the application with your thoughts, but you're not going to go through a similar grading process to what you did with the OPM. Mike has a question. I just want to be conscious that we're getting close to quorum um, and my time's getting a little tight, so okay. I don't want to break quorum. I want to make sure we vote. So I'm not yeah. trying, and I did a lot no. of talking today. So I have extended the meeting, right? So, but so, um, I just wonder if we're close to being able to vote sans small editorial comments from Mr. Bachman and others. So, Steve, yes, you know, it's going to make that motion. But okay, so yeah, we just lost, we just lost Rupert. So, well, is it okay. appropriate time to make a motion? So, do you want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to. Um, <laughs> recommend approval of the RFS as drafted today with minor editorial comments submitted by committee members by the end of today. Second. Second. So um, is there any further discussion on that? Are we, can we take a vote on that motion of this draft? Margaret will clean it up. And then if after, I guess send it all to us, Margaret, yep. you know, as, as revised. And then um, Steve's motion, I think was, uh, you get a second chance to look at it today. Um, and then if it's just wording, you know, if it's a typo or something, it's not going off, but in right. any case. I yeah. mean, they, they also edit my, my, okay, so are we ready to vote? So um, my, I'll just go around the room. Okay, oh, oh we, can, we can do it by now. All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, anyone against? So it is unanimous. Nine. Okay. Well done, team. <laughs> and and then and then um, I think the process will be if you submit it, then they give their edits and changes 
we get to a final that's going to be advertised. So we could uh, convene the committee again to take a vote on the final. Last time we, we missed one step. They wanted to know we had officially approved mm -hmm. the, the RFS as it was going to the register. So um, mm -hmm. you just yeah. have to alert us. There, yeah, there's a little bit of back and forth, but the most important thing is that I get it in today as soon as possible to try and nab that what I understand to be an open slot for the September 15th designer review. So I, I want to, I think that's it. And then Anthony, did that answer your question about the selection criteria? So as just to re to feedback, what I heard is that the MSBA that we didn't change list at the bottom assumes that the list we put up at the top is our objectives or is part of the evaluation. That's review. the evaluation criteria. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think then um, we could have, we can adjourn. Uh, yes? There is, um, we don't have a way for the public to be able to comment because there's no public on Zoom and there's no public in the room. What? <laughs> the public is, <laughs> the public. So, Seeing no public and, and hearing no, I guess in the future, we, we're, we're working out this hybrid mode to yeah. enable the public to join us. Um, so I wanna thank you, Margaret, very much for moving as fast as you did um, to get this to us, to mm -hmm. at least get us. It, it's clear that getting sooner gives us more time for everything Phoebe asked about in, in my case. Yeah in terms of being able to go back to the community yeah. and say, now we're started. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I do want, want to say, I re completely agree with Mike's comment that if the school committee piece of this could move along during the designer selection process, it will make the feasibility process go much more smoothly. So th thanks everyone. Good meeting. We are adjourned. All right. Have a good day. Bye -bye. Thanks for coming in with the edits, Steve. You're not looking. What is this I saw tonight? I decided the less I did to her draft, the better. Yeah. But I put that outdoor space in.